on this episode of Loma Linda 360. This is News for LA, Mike Sarge. Good evening, everyone. A 14-day-old baby girl is fighting for her life tonight after receiving the heart of an infant baboon. It has never been done before, not successfully, and not on a patient so small. Doctors praised the so far successful transplanting of a baboon heart into the body of a baby girl who was certain to die. This uh, little girl had a condition known as hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is 100% fatal. I became uh, deeply impressed with the fact that we'd seen a number of babies with incurable heart disease, incorrectable heart disease, babies in whom you could only experiment uh, surgically with. We were a little uh, uh, stymied about how we were going to find donors for human babies. And so we began to actually study the possibility of cross-species transplantation using, using baby baboons. My options that were, were given to me were, you can leave her here and let her die, you can take her to Barstow Hospital and let her die, or you can take her home and let her die. We had uh, a number, a litany really, of babies that, that came and were diagnosed and died. And for whatever reasons, uh, along came this baby, Stephanie Fay. About 10 years ago, when I was in training at the Hospital of Sick Children in, uh, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, I became uh, deeply impressed with the fact that we'd seen a number of babies with incurable heart disease, incorrectable heart disease, babies in whom you could only experiment uh, surgically with. And uh, it impressed me that what those babies needed really was heart replacement. We were a little... Uh... Uh, stymied about how we were going to find donors for b human babies. No one was uh, volunteering dead babies' hearts for transplantation. And so we began to actually study the possibility of cross-species transplantation using, using baby baboons. And we used little uh, newborn baby goats as uh, models for the transplant. We were able to exchange hearts in those baby goats and then actually grow them up, uh, grow them up to be adults and to have their own babies. That gave us a lot of uh, encouragement that transplantation might have a place in newborns. We had uh, a number, a litany really, of babies that, that came and were diagnosed and died. And for whatever reasons, uh, along came this baby, Stephanie Fay. When I first found out that I was pregnant with Stephanie, I believe I was approximately five months pregnant. And um, two weeks before she was born, um, her dad and I split up. And um, the night before she was born, I started bleeding and so I went into the hospital and she was delivered like I believe it was around three hours later and she was premature and as soon as she was um, born obviously they knew something was wrong um, because they wanted to whisper out of the room very quickly and I um, asked them if I could see her first and so they, they brought her back and let me see her for just a minute, and then they took her. I'm not sure how many hours later it was before they took her down to Loma Linda. There was an ambulance that took her. 
Um, I remember crying that evening and talking to the nurse, um, and I didn't understand what was happening. I was like 24 years old. I had a baby bed and different things, but I ended up going and buying a car seat and some sleepers and different things you know, because I wasn't sure if it was a boy or a girl before she was born. And so I bought some little girl things and headed um, down to the hospital. And so when I got down there, I, I never ever dreamed that um, I would be told that there was nothing that they could do to help her and that she was gonna die. I remember being really upset and I said, you mean you can put a man on the moon, but there's nothing you can do to help her? And he said no. And my options that were, were given to me were, you can leave her here and let her die, you can take her to Barstow Hospital and let her die, or you can take her home and let her die. I said, I really don't know if I can bring her home and let her die in the house. Am I gonna be able to live there after she dies? You know, I was just so um, filled full of mixed emotions. I didn't know if I was coming or going. And um, so when I got to Barstow, I was like, I wanna go to, I'll, I'll go stay in a motel until I can decide what I'm gonna do. And I think it was Wednesday that I brought her back home because I, you know, come to the conclusion that it, it, she had the right to die in her own home, you know, if she was going to die anywhere. And during the two days in the motel, it gave me time to really bond. And I had called my mom and I said, Mom, you really need to come out and see your granddaughter. I said, she's so beautiful. You have to see her before she dies. Uh, Doug Deming, one of the uh, bright young neonatologists, got on the horn and he talked to Baby Faye's mother. And he told me that um, there was a Dr. Bailey who had been out of town and he had done some research doing um, transplantation. If you would be interested, come on back down and, and I'll have you talk to Bailey, who has you know, been spearheading this effort. One of my friends, um, her mom was a Christian and she believed in laying on hands for healing. And so, she prayed, she laid, laid hands on Stephanie and prayed for her. And um, I felt very peaceful about it. I'd never experienced anything like that before. And then um, we bundled Stephanie up and um, took her down to Loma Linda to meet with Dr. Bailey. I had to go find her dad to see if he wanted to go with me. And um, he couldn't come with me. So he said, well, why don't you just bring a tape recorder and you can tape it and then I'll listen to it. We've done our research. We've done it personally, I think. We've inspired well into the issue. We've tried to look at it from every angle. We're sort of at this stage now. Uh, in addition to what's listed here, we've also developed some new experience more recently in climates that is really transplants and having the high spring. I wondered if the doctor was a mad scientist. <laughs> I'm sure I had the same reaction as anybody else who first heard it. But when you get right down to it, it's just an organ. 
and it's a life-saving organ. And so we went over everything and tried to be pretty objective about it, uh, that it was highly experimental and we weren't sure where it, were, where it was headed. Um, but without it, their baby was going to die. At that time, uh, I gave Dr. Bailey the okay to begin tests to see if she was going to be compatible with any of the baboons. And uh, Sandy Canarella, Nelson Canarella, who, who had been our external, if you will, consultant in immunology, or one of them, from New York, uh, needed to be involved if we were going to do it. And in fact, before we chose to go ahead with it, I phoned her and I said, Sandy, are we ready? And he says, he says, Sandy, um, how are we doing on the experiments? And I said, well, I just finished the last one. It looks really great. As soon as I finish with my crew here, I'm going to give you a call. So just hang on, because I know there's three hours difference. You know, he's got time. He would not let me hang up. <laughs> so I, I kept trying to get him off the phone. And finally, he said, OK, so then you would be able to tell our administration and the IRB that it's okay to go ahead. And I said, absolutely, I have no question about it. And he said, good, because I have a baby and six baboons. <laughs> I almost dropped the phone. <laughs> right now, we are in the van going to Ontario Airport to meet Teresa Beauclair, mother of baby Faye. It's 23 years and about four or five months since Teresa first came to uh, Loma Linda and it was then that I met her in October of 1984. That I'm even here, it's kind of hard to believe that on the, on the, when we left Topeka and we got on the turnpike and I'd reach over and say, Bo, we're going to California. <laughs> <laughs> The plane flight was good, so a little, a little bit nervous there a few times, especially yeah, when we were getting ready to land. But you'd have to close the window real quick, <laughs> <laughs> so she couldn't see outside. Yeah, I did close the window a few times. <laughs> so I didn't want to look. And I see pine, or, um, palm trees. Uh, that's different. We don't have palm yeah, trees in Kansas. in Kansas. Except in the mall, of course, they have uh -huh. little palm trees in the mall. <laughs> <laughs> My birthday's, what, four or five days after yours? Mine's August 2nd, and yours is August 5th. 7th. 7th. Yeah. Okay, it's five days. Yeah. Okay. And we had celebrated your birthday, and then I got invited over just for a quiet dinner. <laughs> I get there, and the place is full. <laughs> That was my second birthday in America. Yeah. That was awesome. She was so surprised because I don't think she had a clue. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> and if you did, you acted like you didn't. I didn't have a clue. No. And these are my favorite chaplains okay. ever. Some kind of chaplains, okay. Is that what they call them? The way we love it. <laughs> Bo, are you sampling it? <laughs> do, do that again, Bo. Do it again. Oh. Do you remember that? What's that? Ronald surprise birthday party. No. <laughs> he was pretty Does young. anybody remember anything from when they was three years old? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, anybody in the van. <laughs> I was at home minding my own business on a Friday evening and the phone rang. First response, it was the unit. They were telling me that Dr. Bailey wanted room six ready. Well, I was trying to put two and two together what they were trying to tell me. And then she said, Dr. Bailey's going to do his transplant. We don't know if it's tonight or what's going on. My first reaction after that was I was scared, like, well, I knew we were going to do it. We've been getting ready for over a year, but are we really ready? Will it work? and calling the staff together and telling them that we were going to do an infant transplant. They'd been preparing for it, they were ready for it, and then telling them that um, there was going to be a little difference with the surgery because of where the donor heart was being procured. And so I threw out, I said, um, and they were all like, okay, and I said, we're going to use a primate donor. And one of the nurses looks at me and says, what's a primate? <laughs> I said, okay. I said, we're going to use a baboon donor. 
and I can remember, I mean, the staff just looking at me and then telling them it's a need to know, strictest of confidence, no information to go off the unit. It was one of the best kept secrets, a staff of probably 60 or 70 people. Because when you think back at the size of Loma Linda, even at the time, how stuff didn't leak out. So for the next week, it was, um, I was still staying in Barstow, and my mom would stay with Bo during the day, and I would drive up in the morning and come back in the evening, and I was doing that every day. The hospital asked me if I wanted to stay in an apartment where it would be closer to the hospital, where I wouldn't have so much driving to do. And I said yes, and so um, Bo and my mom and I started staying in an apartment down here. I spent a lot of evenings um, reading letters. Reading letters that people sent mm -hmm. from baby fans? Yeah. All the letters that I received were very supportive. We just want you to remember. I thought maybe you coming back here might help you remember some parts. Hello, my name's Teresa, and um, 23 and a half years ago, I stayed in this apartment. Would it be possible for yeah, me? Yeah, come on in. This was, yeah, it still, it still looks the same. And there was a table over here, and we used to sit and eat or have coffee or the sun used to shine in from the window and we would sit there in the mornings. <laughs> and Grandma came up and she was here. Um, it seems like so long ago, but just yesterday. Yeah. Teresa was just so brave. I, I, I can't imagine what it had to be like to be that mother, um, to make those enormous decisions. Um, she was a rock. You know, when I think about what she went through, I, just what I went through was terrific, and it wasn't my child. And I think she did the only thing she really could do, being a mother. And that was to say, yes, I want to do anything I can to save my child. She, I know that um, she almost died like the night before her surgery because I believed that her lungs were filling up with fluid. And um, I was, had made friends with, um, I had met Bill Hinton and he was a chaplain at the hospital, which he became like a father figure to me. The day before I was told the surgery is going to be tomorrow and I had met Teresa and uh, the father and we had a chance to get acquainted. And um, the day before the surgery, we made a, an agreement that the morning of the surgery, uh, they were gonna take her about seven o'clock, that we would be there at six o'clock. She instead, I, when I got there at six, I asked where she was, oh, she's been in with the baby for an hour and a half. At six, Thir well, at six o'clock, the three of us met, Len Bailey, Walla Concepcion, and myself. We were the three musketeers. And um, made our final plans, and Waldo and I decided to go out for a walk. It was just exciting. It was just exciting but sober because this is or going to work very well or is going to have very adverse outcome. And so this is the uncertainty. There's no precedent. You, you just don't have their any back history. So it's, it's exciting, but it's a lot of also sober responsibility that you got to be sure that everything is okay. We were walking away from the hospital and we were watching the time because we knew we had to be back at 6.30 to start. And when we turned around, the clouds opened up and the sun came out and a rainbow came right down into the institution. It was a phenomenon that just I will never forget. And I said, you know, Waldo, this is going to happen, and it's going to be okay. Because you can imagine how nervous we were. We were scared to death. And we had made the commitment, and we were going to go ahead. And uh, then we started down the journey of one of the hardest things we had to do, and that was to take that animal, because we felt very close to these animals. 
sorry. It still bothers me. It's very difficult to, um, to make these decisions sometimes. And so we chose um, the most compatible uh, baby baboon for her. And we did, did the transplant as if uh, we were doing any other open heart surgery in a baby. You know, I, I knew that there was a chance that she wouldn't come out alive. And I knew that there was a chance that she would. And I stood there and I, I was pretty emotional. The baby and she and I walked down with bassinet or whatever it was on wheels and went all the way down to the elevator, then down the elevator and to the door of the surgery and something very special happened there. They stopped just before going through the doors and she went up by the little girl and bent down and loved her, kissed her and uh, touched her on the cheek, I think, and then said, um, I love you. As soon as she said, I love you, then they moved the, the thing on into the surgery and there we stood looking at a door and there was a lady that came around the corner. And I don't know who that lady was to this day. She, I believe she was a nurse or one of God's angels <laughs> because she handed me um, a little card and it was the, um, had the poem Footprints on it. And I had never read that poem before. I still have that card in, her, in Stephanie's Bible. This is Stephanie's Bible, and it's been well used. And I bought it for her on October the 23rd, 1984. This was the card that the angel handed me. I would have bought this what, three days before her surgery. Her surgery was October 26th. They tried to ease my mind and show me photo albums and Bill had all these beautiful roses and uh, showed me pictures of the, you know, because he liked photography and it was, um, you know, just to kind of help give me something soothing to think about other than worrying about what they were doing in the operating room. We have the uh, privilege today of being in the very room, room three, and the University Operating Room the uh, Theater Suite. Room three is where Baby Faye's operation occurred. Just imagine, if you will, Baby Faye uh, on that operating table under those lights having her operation 25 years ago. It was so exciting and nerve-wracking and frightening all at the same time, and uh, it was all very quiet and, and yet busy like you would expect it to be, but it very um, together. It was, it was a very beautifully orchestrated and coordinated team that you could see had worked together before. The anesthesiologists and the nurses and, you know, everybody involved. So we uh, brought the donor heart up through the stairwells and the hallways, up through the back way, and then uh, in through the door over here and uh, deposited in cold saline over near the operating table. And I scrubbed in and, uh, and started the uh, operation on baby Faye. Bill kind of whisked me off into, um, back up to the waiting room where we'd be waiting with her surgery. And we went into the chapel and we prayed and there was a statue of Jesus holding a lamb with the mother watching him take care of her baby. And I said, Teresa, the shepherd, that's Jesus. And that little lamb up there, that's baby Faye. And that's how I felt, that, you know, she was in Jesus' hands, and I had to have faith that um, he was going to take care of her. 
And then the big moment came when, you know, you look into this child's chest and there's no heart there. You know, when they take that heart out, it's, um, it's really very frightening. And, you know, when we looked at her heart, everything that we, you know, knew about it before was there in front of us then. And clearly this child would not have lived um, in any way. Um, and then, of course, they brought the baboon heart in and it was the perfect size absolutely perfect and he had that heart in no time and then the big moment came when you start to rewarm the baby let the blood flow through the heart and you're waiting for that first beat the phone rang and you could hear a pin drop on this unit which is unusual on an ICU unit because what we wanted to hear we wanted to hear one piece of information was that heart did the heart beat was it beating Next time on Loma Linda 360. There were so many reporters and picketers and so many things that were distractive, you know, at the time. And I was young and I was scared and I wanted everybody to leave me alone. And it just wasn't happening. There were a lot of reporters and a lot of media people who were all of a sudden paying attention to the ethics side of doing a major medical experiment. This is uh, 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 technically and scientifically a fraud. If you have no choice, if you have a hope of saving a child by sacrificing an animal, I don't see any argument against doing that. I wanted to be able to transplant the babies. I wanted them to live. Uh, I think that was an open, honest uh, effort. I don't know why it all started with her. You know, God, God, only God knows. But it had to start somewhere. <laughs>